The following message was presented during the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries 2018 Prophecy Conference season. Now here's Mike Stallard with a message from Matthew chapter 24, Day of Tribulation. Well, good morning to all of you. It's good to be uh, back with you this year. I'm getting used to Winona Lake, my third year uh, to be here, and uh, we're excited uh, about uh, studying the Olivet Discourse together. I don't know about you, but I'm a little tired of the misrepresentations of our view of prophecy that are out there. We just are unfairly criticized and caricatured. And one particular one that sticks in my craw is they they say this to us. You guys look at the Olivet Discourse and most of Daniel and most of the book of Revelation as in the future. And because it's in the future, it's not any good for us now. Are you kidding me? You know, we live in the shadow of two comings. We live in the shadow of the cross. And all that that means for us. And we live in the shadow of the second coming. In terms of our mission as the church, I am gospel-centered because that's our mission. But in terms of all of my theology, I'm Jesus-centered. It's all that he's done, past, present, and future, that means so much to us and should cause in our hearts to erupt a great devotion that refuses to give up following after him. All the scriptures are inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us, but verse 17 says it's profitable. That means even those things that are in our future have application to us now and mean something, have significance for us. So when people start saying, you're, you're so future, future-minded, future you're no present good, just ignore them because they're not good anywhere, probably. <laughs> so let's, let's get into the text. My assignment today, Matthew 24, beginning in verse 6. And I have the text up here on the screen. Let's go through it uh, together. You don't have to read it out loud, uh, but let me read it uh, to you. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, or some translation, birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is an interesting passage, and we will not have time to deal with every little thing in the passage, but I'm going to try my best to cover as much of it as we can. And uh, when we look at the general flow of the whole passage, there are different views of how all this is put together. And I used to be a a seminary professor, so I like to give the views. And of course, I save my view, which is the correct view, till the end. So we'll walk through this uh, together. And it's uh, taken in a chronological sense. There are many good interpreters who take Matthew 24, 4 through 8, going back into the section covered by Pat, um, as the church age, the the time near the end of the church age, the beginning of earth pangs, is talking about that. And I can understand why they would do that. It talks about wars and rumors of wars. Don't we see a lot of that today? I mean, there are all kinds of things uh, going on in our uh, history books, you read them, and it's the story of war, isn't it? Everywhere you turn. In fact, I looked it up this morning on the internet, so I know it's true. <laughs> I just asked Google, Mr. Google, um, 
How many wars are going on right now? And one of the sites that came up, it was easier to say which countries are not affected by conflict right now, and it's 11. Only 11 countries not affected by some kind of physical conflict uh, right now. And so I can see why people would be given to this talking about the church age. And in this particular view, then uh, Matthew 24, 9 to 14, would be the first half of the tribulation period, first three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. And then you have uh, 24, 15, the abomination of desolation, which we're going to, I think it's Bruce Scott's going to deal with that, the midpoint of the tribulation. And then 16 to 26, the second half of the tribulation, or the great tribulation. So this is one approach to that. Another approach is you take the first half as 4 through 14, um, you know, our verses are most of that section, uh, beginning of birth pains, the first three and a half years, with the midpoint, the abomination of desolation in verse 15, followed by verses 16 to 26, second half of the tribulation. And some people will parse it differently at the end, go to verse 28 or wherever that is to mark it off before you have the actual second coming described. And then you have the view that four through eight is the first half of the tribulation, and that 9 through 14 is the second half of the tribulation. And of course, the uh, Matthew 24, 16 to 26 would give a further explanation of that, but part of that explanation would include the midpoint uh, that actually goes between the first and the second half of the tribulation. This is another view. And it uh, is emphasized, I think, because in verses 9 to 14, there are obviously some things there that this, it actually uses the language, goes to the end of the age. The gospel of the kingdom is preached to the end of the world. Uh, you have all those kind of things to the end of the age. So that's why that's there. So I'm going to combine them uh, in this way. I see 4 to 14, the first half of the trip, the beginning of birth pains, midpoint, verse 15, then 16 to 26, second half of the trip. But I see the judgments that begin in the first half continue into the second half, only intensified. So these things that are talked about in 6 to 14 will be things that appear, begin to appear in the first half and have some ramifications for the first half, but continue on into the second half. And if uh, you don't like my view there, that's okay. I'll have a hamburger and a milkshake with you, especially if you pay. Well, uh, let me talk next about the correlation between the seal judgments in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24. This is one of the reasons I, I don't see the church age as mentioned in verses 4 to 8. It's a, it's a very significant thing, but I want to walk through this. The first, uh, Matthew 24, let's look at verses 10 and 11 in Matthew 24, verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Back in verse 9, there were people being killed. You'll be hated by all nations for my namesake. It ends up with many false prophets rising up and deceiving many, and Pat discussed that very well in his presentation. We can also go down to verse 24 and the false Christ and false prophets that are mentioned there. But if you go over to Revelation chapter 6, in the first two verses, you see the first seal. Now, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see, and I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And our interpretation generally of that passage, and there are other people who disagree with that too, but are interpreting this is the Antichrist, the false Christ who shows up on the white horse appearing as if he's messianic in some way. And so you have a false witness, and that correlates well to things that are given, and that's in the seal judgments, which obviously are not in the church age. Then we go to the um, second seal, Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So there is war. 
We already talked a little bit about the idea of war. But you know, if you go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 3, the second horse. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. And for the second seal, then, we have a red horse and war. Again, that's in the first half of the trip. Now, you've heard it said, perhaps, that the first half of the trib is peaceful. At least I've heard that by some. And the second half is where it really gets bad. Well, Israel is protected somewhat in the first half, but there's war. There's plenty of war. All the way through the first half, it just intensifies as we go. And so, again, we have in the first half the seals matching up with Matthew 24 and the presentment of war during the first half of the trib and the birth pangs, so to speak. Then in uh, Matthew 24, 7, go back there. We had read part of that verse. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines pestilences and earthquakes in various places. So famines. Now when you go to Revelation 6, 5 and 6, the third seal, what do we see? We see a black horse. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. The last phrase, the rich people maybe can last longer. But the whole point is extreme inflation and famine where you can't even afford a loaf of bread. That's the picture there. And of course, Jesus predicts that in Matthew 24. Here it is in Revelation chapter 6. John writes it. Uh, probably 30 years later after Matthew is written, but certainly 60 years after Jesus had given the statement. Now when we go back to Matthew 24, 6 and 7, we see again you will hear of wars, rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, all these things will come to pass, but the end is not yet. But there's famines, verse 7, pestilences, that's diseases, Earthquakes, war, famine, pestilence. Now, if you go to Revelation 6, the fourth seal, you have the pale horse. You, of course, remember this from that great movie, Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. If you ever pay attention to that movie, as he's riding his horse into the, the mining camp at the beginning of the movie, the teenage girl in the movie is reading this passage. Watch for that next time you see a rerun of that movie. Um, very interesting, the take on the, on the passage uh, that they're doing. Uh, but verse 7, open the fourth seal, I heard the, the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse, a green horse. And notice, the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And the word death is a word there for pestilence. And so you have in this passage brought together sword, war, hunger, famine, pestilence, all these things that Matthew says here in Revelation. In fact, Revelation also, this particular end of this section, is a quote from Ezekiel. And Ezekiel 5 and Ezekiel 14, it uses this imagery and calls it the wrath of God. You say, why is that significant? It tells us that here in Revelation chapter 6, he's talking about the wrath of God. Well, why is that significant? Because there's some interpreters who don't believe it's the wrath of God. It is. The quote from the Ezekiel in the fourth seal proves it's the wrath of God. And so all the seals, I think, are in the first half of the trib, and are indeed the wrath of God poured out upon the world. 
So, uh, we move to the fifth seal, and we see even some more here. In verse uh, Matthew 24, verse 9, then they will deliver you up to, uh, to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So there are martyrs. And then in Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 11, what do you see when you come to the fifth seal? When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they're crying out, how long, O Lord, till you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So you have in Revelation 6 another, in the fifth seal, right out of Matthew 24. And then the sixth seal, we already saw in 24-7 the earthquakes. In Revelation 6, 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. There's also cosmic signs that are in the passage. But you have this earthquake, and you have earthquakes before. And of course, some are saying, well, um, Earthquakes are increasing, therefore it's a sign of the end of the times. Have you heard that? I had a colleague when I used to teach at seminary who, who he did a little detailed study saying that earthquakes are declining. And then I hear other guys say it's increasing. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter what's happening right now. In the trib, it's going to explode in earthquakes. And this is a big one. So that's a prediction. It's a future thing. It's not talking about the church age. It's talking about the tribulation period, this great earthquake of the sixth seal. And Jesus reminds us there will be earthquakes. And so uh, when we see all of that, what are, what's the end result? What are the implications? Well, first, it means that Matthew 24, 48 is probably not talking about the church age, but talking about the tribulation period. Also, this passage, 6 to 14, specifies judgments that begin in the first half of the tribulation and continue into the second half. Let's take war, for example. War starts with the second seal, mentions war, but we have the battle of Armageddon at the end, right? That's war. And Jesus comes and defeats all of his enemies by the word of his mouth, with the sword in his mouth. And so you have uh, implications for the fact that there's a correlation between the book of Revelation and Matthew. Let's look at verse 9, the word tribulation. I don't know what translation you happen to be using. I'm using the New King James. But if you have a King James Bible, it says there to be afflicted. It doesn't use the noun tribulation. If you have a New International Version, it says to be persecuted. It doesn't use the word tribulation. If you have the New King James Version, it's like mine, says tribulation. Uh, if you use the inspired New American Standard Bible, it says tribulation. If you use the ESV, it says tribulation. Okay? Now, I've, I've read into some interpreters who kind of say we shouldn't call the uh, seven years the tribulation, or at least the first part of it, we shouldn't call it the tribulation. Uh, and I think maybe they're reading the King James or the NIV or some translation where it's been turned into a verb. But uh, if you, the word tribulation in verse t 9 is the same Greek word as in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation. It's the same word. So the word tribulation is a good word to cover the entire seven years, certainly to cover this part here in Matthew uh, 24, 6 to 14, and which correlates to Revelation chapter 6 and the first six seals. So that's the tribulation. We come to lawlessness in verse 12. It says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I tried to find a picture that would fit lawlessness. <laughs> That's the best I could do, sorry. Um, of course, lawlessness is not really a laughing matter, is it? Lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And you and I look at American culture today and we say, that's happening now, right? Um, 
you just uh, think about this. Um, every generation thinks that the generation behind them are going to pot. I don't mean marijuana by that, okay. In fact, in all of my days, I've, I've never heard someone say, the young people are better than us. I just don't hear that. In fact, don't tell anybody, but I don't say that. I certainly don't say that to my kids or my grandkids. Habakkuk 1, 1 to 4, he complains. Uh, I, I refer to him sometimes as he's a complaining prophet. He just complains. About, God, look at all this bad stuff going on in our culture here, and you're not doing anything about it. And God says, I'm already doing something about it. I'm raising up the Babylonians to come and destroy you. He didn't like that answer. Uh, but God's doing that. Things are bad, and he's in America. You know, God, why don't you stop abortion? All those things that we think of. Things are getting bad, and they're getting worse. And so we feel that. In some parts of the world, though, Christianity is doing better than it is in Europe and the United States. We're about 100 years behind Europe. Uh, they're already in the tank. They need, they need missionary uh, work and revival like crazy. So do we now. Things look bad. You know, since we've kicked God out of our culture, we're a much more legalistic culture. Have you noticed that? Sue happy, go to court. Civil discourse is gone. You can't have a reasonable conversation about anything anymore. So when you begin to get away from God, you certainly begin to lose love for people. They go together. And, and so when we look at this lawlessness, it begins in the first half of the tribulation. Yes, we experience it now. He's talking about something that's coming. That's going to be a special uh, lawlessness. We can sense application, like I said, to our day. But what is it? It's an increase of rejection of God that leads to a loss of love. You reject God, it's rejecting salvation through Jesus, rejecting God's ways for living, for marriage and family, anything. And although we experience some of those things today, he's talking about the trib. Jesus is predicting in the trib there is going to be a super rise of lawlessness. And of course, that shouldn't surprise us because who shows up at the beginning of the trib? The Antichrist, and one of his names or tags is man of what? Lawlessness. He's the master of reviling everything that God is, says, and stands for. And so that is lawlessness, and Jesus predicts it's in the future. Then we come to this phrase, Matthew 24, 13. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. I've had people use this verse to tell me that I'm not saved. Have you had people do that to you? What does this verse mean? but he that endures to the end shall be saved. Now, you remember when you, when you park your car somewhere, like even here, you gotta remember where you parked, right? Well, let's remember where, where this verse is parked. What's the context? We're in a discussion of the tribulation period. It needs to fit that. You can't just pull it out of context and put it on a plaque on the wall. You shouldn't, I shouldn't walk into any of your homes and see this verse up on the wall by itself. You want to put all of Matthew 24 up there, that's fine. But don't have it up there by itself, or we'll have a little conversation. Um, there's some different views of this. One must continue to do good works throughout life in order to finally be saved. If I endure, that is, if I endure in doing good deeds, that's the idea. I've got to do a bunch of good deeds, and then I'll get saved. Folks, uh, friends of Israel, we don't believe in salvation by works. We accept what the Bible says. We're saved by grace through faith. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
Over, over 200 times the Bible teaches that we come to God by faith. It's not about what we have done. It's about what he has done. And we can't get away from that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Another view is if you're a true believer, you're eternally secure. I've actually heard people say that's what it's saying. You're, you're going to be saved to the end. God's going to keep you. Well, that's certainly a true doctrine, in my opinion. Uh, but I don't think that's what this verse is saying. Others say you must continue in good works to prove that you are one of the elect. Of course, prove to who? God already knows I'm one of the elect. If I'm one of the elect, I don't have to prove it to him. But what's the purpose of my good deeds? My purpose of my good deeds is to do what? Let my light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. The purpose of my good deeds is not for myself. It's not to pump myself up. It's not to prove anything to myself. It's to prove to others that there's a God in heaven. That's the purpose of my good deeds. So it's not really that. And this one, which is my view, the physical deliverance for those who make it to the end of the trip. It's talking about physical salvation, not spiritual salvation. So be very careful when you inter interpret the Bible, folks. You know, every time you see the word water, it doesn't mean baptism. You understand? Same way, every time it says saved, it's not talking about eternal life with God in heaven. Be careful. Sometimes saved or delivered means delivered from something else in the context. So you've got to be careful as you read the text. Note the context here. Uh, you know, in, even before verse 12, I've listed verse 12 here, but, you know, he's talking about all these horrible things that are happening. The wars and rumors of wars and people hating you and people getting killed and people hating each other, false prophets arising, lawlessness abounding. That's the context in which he says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Well, it has to be endured. All these difficulties have to be endured for this deliverance to take place. And, of course, in verse 14, uh, it mentions the end. Earlier, in fact, uh, I think three times in this passage, it refers to the end. Well, what's the end? Going back up to the first part in the questions, the end of the age. Matthew 13, the parable of the tares, it tells us that uh, that's the end of the age is when the angels come. Je Jesus sends them to gather the elect. Then in Matthew 28, the Great Commission passage, Jesus promises he's with us till when? Till the end of the age. That's when he returns. So everything is pointing to the second coming after the trib. That's, that's how I take this. And he's basically saying when that time comes, you'll be delivered. Now some people will die, some believers will die, and they'll be delivered through death. But those who make it all the way to the end, they will experience Jesus demolishing all those evil things that had plagued him for all these seven years of tribulation period. And I think he's just making a promise about that. I think it's something simpler than a lot of people make it out to be. Why? Because they get hung up on the word saved. So be careful with that. So enduring could refer to just staying alive, you know, if you make it to the end, or it could be referring to being faithful in life, but it's a promise. I think if you make it to the end, he's going to deliver you physical deliverance for those who make it to the end of the trip. But there's one other verse in this section that's a big one. Verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Some say we have to preach the gospel to the whole world so we can have the rapture. Well, you know what? That's our commission to preach the gospel to the whole world. And then the people that come to Christ disciple them and teach them to follow the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's all important, but we don't have to make it to every single person on the planet before the rapture happens. There's no requirement for that. And a matter of fact, the gospel here is a little bit different than the gospel of eternal life. But we need to look through that. What is this gospel 
of eternal life. Well, it's good news that the kingdom is at hand. It's good news that the kingdom is at hand, and in particular, what kingdom does it say? The kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in Matthew, that's always, in my opinion, the kingdom that will begin when Jesus returns. So what is it the good news that the kingdom is at hand? John the Baptist had preached that in Matthew 3. He preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached it in Matthew 4, 17. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I think the idea was the Messiah is around the corner. He's in Jesus' case, he's here. So the kingdom, we can get on with the kingdom if you want. And they rejected him. So, uh, and of course that didn't surprise him. He knew that was going to happen. He had that all planned out, the sovereign God of heaven. He knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. Uh, and so later on, the kingdom is going to come. In the meantime, as during the church age, we are calling out kingdom citizens. We're winning people to Jesus who are citizens of that coming kingdom. So in the tribulation period, notice the Jewish context again. He's talking to the Jews in all these passages. Jesus, John the Baptist talking to the Jews about the kingdom. Jesus talking to the Jews about their kingdom. Yeah, will you and I be part of it? Yes. Gentiles will be part of it. But it's a Jewish context. And in Revelation 11, there's an announcement. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign for a thousand years. I didn't read that right, did I? You need to understand that, okay? He reigns forever and ever. And here's an announcement. This is about the midpoint of the tribulation period that this announcement's made. In chapter 12, Satan goes after Israel. In chapter 13, Antichrist goes after the world. And then in uh, chapter 14, you have a, a vision, I think, of the millennium. Chapters 15 and 16, you have the bold judgments poured out on the world. 17 and 18, you have the destruction of Babylon. And then 19, Jesus finally gets here to set up his kingdom. Destroys all the enemies. And the announcement is given. What we're about to see takes us to the kingdom. So that is the good news. To all those who are in the tribulation period who hear this, the kingdom is right around the corner. That's the good news. Now, the other questions uh, in your notes, if you have your notes there in the little booklet. What is the content of the gospel of the kingdom? I've just explained that to you. Number two, how does the gospel of the kingdom differ from the gospel of eternal life? Well, the gospel of eternal life is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in our place on the cross. First Corinthians 15, Paul was very clear about that. The implications of that are many, but the implications are not the gospel. The gospel is simple, folks. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. Jesus died on the cross, taking upon him and his entire person our sins. And then he was punished in our place, Isaiah 53. God crushed him for us, Isaiah 53 says. And then he was buried, and then he rose again from the dead for our justification. And that's applied to us by faith. We talked about that. We trust him and trust him only, and we're forgiven of all our sins. That's the gospel of eternal life. I'm going to come back to that one more time. To whom is this gospel of the kingdom preached? Question number three. To whom is it preached? Look in the passage again, verse 14. Will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. So this gospel of the kingdom is not something that's preached and declared just to the Jewish people. Although they have a significant part, central part in God's coming kingdom, the announcement is also for the world. All people. Have you ever noticed Daniel 7:13 that in God's coming kingdom? It's going to be great diversity, people from every tribe and tongue and nation. God loves diversity. And it's going to come. And number four, is this preaching talking about the church age or the tribulation period? Based on everything we've said, what do you think I'm going to say? 
tribulation period. Remember the context. So this is something, yeah, we can make progress in, in uh, talking about the gospel of eternal life with Jesus, spreading that around. We can also talk that the kingdom's coming one day and announce that. And we can spread that now, but we're talking about the tribulation period. And to what does the end refer? The end is when Jesus comes. Number six, can someone enter the kingdom without believing in Jesus? That is, accepting him as Savior, trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection as payment for sin. The answer is no. You have to trust the gospel of eternal life so that you can have entrance into the kingdom, so that the announcement of the kingdom means something for you. You have the announcement of the kingdom. We're going to talk about the uh, foolish, the, the ten virgins, the five foolish and the five wise virgins later on this week. And some are ready and some are not. When that announcement of the kingdom is there, does it mean something for you? So what about you? What does it mean for you? If you're a believer, you need to do all you can to help other people see the light. If you're not a believer, consider the claims of Christ upon your life. Trust him now before these horrible times come.